Hello, everybody. Welcome into the Apples and Genos Fantasy Hockey Podcast. My name is Nick Nibblink. I'm the creator of Apples and Genos, originator of the Zero G Draft Strategy, and contributor to Yahoo Fantasy. In this podcast and live stream, I'm going to go over the most puzzling players league wide as submitted by the Apples and Genos Discord server. Let's get it. All right, welcome back, everybody. We're going to get into these puzzling players that you can see on the screen if you are watching live on YouTube. But also, I'm going to take a quick second and talk to you about some news and notes, some newsies from around the league. First off, we got to talk about Leo Carlson. He's playing his third straight game tonight. I'm starting to wonder if this load management thing wasn't just something else where they kind of just uh, saying one thing and, do and doing something else. I don't know. Leo Carlson has looked really good. And obviously, if he continues to stick in the lineup and makes it impossible for them to really <laughs> force him out of it, then uh, that's going to be a good thing for everybody in Anaheim. So I'm watching that one pretty closely because I think that's a net positive for everybody. Everybody, Minchikov, for Terry, for Zegris, all these guys that he's playing with. So that's an interesting one for sure. Tonight we've got Sam Bennett playing back from injury. We've got Lawson Kraus back from injury as well. So that's good for both of those guys. And we've got Mike Matheson. The latest that I've seen still is that he's a game time decision. And it's unfortunate because he's playing a late game today. So you're not really going to have a great idea of whether he's going to be in or not. I know there's been some questions in the Discord already about what to do with Mike Matheson for tonight. Uh, in my case, uh, I've sat him in a spot, uh, basically just kept him on IR plus and kind of had somebody else who is a returning streamer from last week and they're playing tonight. So running with that one for tonight, uh, if you're able to do that, then that's kind of the simple way to do it. But, uh, yeah, unfortunately a lot of people having to make a decision without a lot of information on Matheson for tonight. And lastly, we've got an Andre Vasilevsky sighting. And according to Coach John Cooper, it sounds like he's on track and they're thinking somewhere around Thanksgiving is when Andre Vasilevsky will be back in the Tampa Bay lineup. So that's exciting for those who drafted him, uh, especially for those who drafted him without knowing about the injury. If you drafted early and you got blindsided by it, uh, yeah, it seems like in the end it won't be quite as bad as maybe you thought, and hopefully he's back to his normal self uh, sooner rather than later for all of our fantasy teams. All right, well... That out of the way, we can move on to the puzzling players. Puzzling players are voted on, as I mentioned, by the Apples and Genos Discord server. I put out a call in there every single Monday, and I tell people to kind of vote for or give a thumbs up to the players that they're most interested in hearing about. So this is kind of a little bit of a democracy here about which players are the most puzzling to the most people. And that's what we go through every Monday here at 8 p.m. EST. And the number one player was Alexander Barkov, uh, which was a little bit interesting to me. I honestly, personally, have not really had any qualms about Barkov to speak of. Uh, he's got a goal and an assist tonight, so maybe the qualms that some people are having have gone away already. You can see he had four points in his last four games uh, on the screen here, if you're watching live. Uh, the metrics weren't great, but I was never really concerned about him, to be honest with you. It never even really crossed my mind to be concerned about him. And definitely, yeah, you see a goal and an assist tonight already. This game is, uh, yeah, just starting in the second period here. So he's doing it already tonight, and I have no concerns about Barkov. You know, for these star players... I, I'm never going to get too excited one way or another. I really trust my initial projections on the star players. In a lot of these cases, they've given us a long stretch of um, 
one level of play and I feel very very confident in their ability to maintain that moving forward so for a lot of star players I have a pretty long leash even if they're not quite getting what I thought uh, in terms of the underlying metrics or the time on ice there's always going to be a longer leash for these star players in my mind because I'm always quite confident in my projections for them so Barkov, no qualms. I do still think that he's got a legit shot at a point per game. One of the bigger things that I think uh, with the news coming out that Brandon Montour and Aaron Ekblad are on their way back and could be back around that American Thanksgiving time frame as well. That's going to be a big boon for everybody else uh, in Florida. Sam Reinhart surely hasn't uh, felt those effects, but maybe somebody like Barkov at just a point per game till tonight. Uh, we'll get a little bit of a boost from that. Uh, maybe the Matthew Tichuk that some people have submitted tonight as well didn't make this list, but there were a couple of votes for Matthew Tichuk as well. So maybe that will kind of get washed out. We do have Sam Bennett, as I mentioned, coming back in. So the Panthers are starting to get healthy, and that should be pretty scary for um, the rest of the Eastern Conference and for the opponents of any fantasy managers who have a bunch of Panthers in their lineup. I'm looking forward to Montour coming back on one team, Ekblad on another, Bennett coming back in another tonight for me. Um, I'm pretty excited about what this Panthers team might do once they have a full complement back in the lineup and healthy. Moving on to the next one, that's going to be Drake Batherson. Drake Batherson, four points in his last five games, 17 and a half minutes average time on ice. The underlying numbers in this stretch are, I would say, Okay, 121st in shots per 60, 101st in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, 110th in Corsi, 4 per 60, and 94th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. You do expect better from Batherson. Um, yeah, just because he's on the top power play, uh, he's obviously in the early going, was not skating with a lot of really good line mates, but in the last little bit has been skating on a line with Josh Norris, and that's obviously a good player and somebody that you can kind of hang your hat on and say he should be able to succeed with this player. And in the last game, I was also playing with Tarasenko on the other wing, which should uh, be pretty much like if Ottawa is going to load up their top six, it should be Drew, Tchuk, Stutzla, Tarasenko, Batherson, Norris, right? That should be the top six if they're going to just totally load it up. And so that should be all a net positive for uh, Drake Batherson. The one thing I will say is that line got absolutely caved in in their game against the Penguins. They had one shot and 11 shots against at even strength. So I don't know how long that line will stick if they continue to get uh, absolutely run out of the barn like that but uh, for what it's worth Batherson himself again I'm not too worried about just yet if it goes for a long time and he's unable to really kind of uh, replicate those those shot numbers that uh, I thought he was going to get to then maybe you know I'll start to have some worry but we're still very early in the season Josh Norris coming back they're still finding their chemistry I'm just overall, there's just too many mitigating factors for me to move off what was my initial projection. Uh, I am seeing less ice time overall, and that's a little bit of a concern uh, relative to what I thought he would get. But overall, I just can't say that I'm overly concerned about the uh, underlying numbers here just yet for Batherson. Uh, maybe another two weeks if we're looking at the exact same kind of thing, exact same production, exact same underlying metrics, then maybe at that point, once we've got, you know, twice as many games here under our belts, then I'm getting to a point where I'm a little bit more concerned about Drake Batherson, but not yet. Let's move on. Let's talk about Troy Terry. Just two points in his last five games, five points in eight games on the season. That's a 51-point pace. Not great. Over his last five games, though, averaging over 20 minutes. Mentioned the yeah, the chemistry with uh, Leo Carlson. Blake's talked about it in a couple of pods recently about how Troy Terry wants Leo Carlson out there. It is the carlson zegris terry line going once again tonight together. You like to see that. And the metrics are pretty solid here for Terry under the hood, especially given the 20 minutes uh, time on ice. 84th in shots per 60, 71st in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. And the on ice numbers are quite good, especially for... Uh, being on a team like Anaheim, right? 44th in Corsi, 4 per 60, 58th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. I like all of that. Just a 7.1 shooting percentage. Um, 
in these last five games, a 9.1 shooting percentage on the season, 6.9 on ice shooting percentage on the season. All that's going to go up for Troy Terry. I'm not super concerned about Troy Terry. In fact, this might be a good buy low spot. Uh, we'll see. Maybe he will pop off in the second half of the game here tonight. Um, hasn't done so, so far, but maybe there's a chance that that happens. And uh, you end up in a in a spot where Troy Terry is unattainable again. But if there is a chance to go out and get Troy Terry, and you can get away with offering a you know a decent package, but uh, definitely less than um, what you might perceive he's worth, especially given Anaheim's schedule. Right, that's an underrated part of what makes Troy Terry valuable is not only the ice time and the deployment on what appears to be a better situation than in years past, but also the fact that Anaheim just plays all these off nights every single year and this year is no different. So Troy Terry always going to make his way into your lineup regardless uh, because of those off nights. Keep pushing and talk about Grubauer and Decord. So tonight they are going with Grubauer. Joey Decord got three starts in a row before that. I had a spot where I had Grubauer and I just kept holding him thinking that, oh, he's going to get the next start. He's going to get the next start. Oh, he's going to get the next start. And that start never came. And I held Grubauer for a full week where he gave me literal zeros. So that did not feel very good. I still have him and he's playing tonight. Right now the Kraken are up 3-2 in the early part of the second period. He's already given up a couple goals, which is not great, but the Kraken are winning. Um, yeah. We'll see how this game goes. It's really a case right now where I'm watching very closely. Like, you have to at this point. It's very clear that they're willing to go to Decord, that Grubauer's contract is not a deterrent for them to, you know, just keep giving him starts, even if he's not performing better than Decord. So it really does look like a true hot hand situation here. And overall, like... I can't blame them. Uh, if Decord is going to play decently well and Grubauer is not, then they're going to keep going back to Decord. I think that the team context here, I'm, whenever I'm talking about goalies, right, I always want to examine the team context and kind of figure out what I what I can make of the team themselves and what I think that that outcome might look like. And overall, I think that the Kraken are actually a pretty good team. They are fourth in the league in scoring chances against per 60 at even strength. So they are not giving up a lot of scoring chances against. They're giving up actually a fair amount of chances of Corsi. Uh, if you just go by Corsi against, you would think, oh, they're terrible. They are, uh, what is this, 25th in the league in Corsi against. But they're allowing a lot of perimeter shots. It seems like a definite game plan kind of thing where they'll allow a lot of shots from the outside collapse, but not a lot not allow a lot of scoring chances from in tight and that's actually a pretty good situation right for a fantasy goaltender you want your goaltender to get saves uh, but not obviously goals against so it seems like a pretty solid situation overall and the Kraken are you know above 50 percent at even strength they're 10th in the league in scoring chance for percentage they are getting uh, a little bit behind the 50 percent mark 17th in the league in Corsi for percentage so you know, take all that for what you will, but I do think that Seattle is still a good place and a place that we should be interested in who the starting goaltender is. So we'll see how this game goes tonight. I would still anticipate that unless uh, Grubauer completely shuts the door and looks terrific from the rest of the way in this game here tonight, that we would see uh, Joey Decord come back in the next start. That would be my anticipation at this point. <laughs> my confidence level is not super high. Um, but that would be my anticipation. And then I honestly think that it's going to depend on the performances in these two games. So how Grubauer does tonight against Tampa, how Decord might do if he does get that start on Thursday against Nashville, and then they'll see who they start uh, in Calgary. That would be the way I'd read it. That would be, you know, just based on seeing a hundred of these situations play out across many teams over the last number of years that I've been playing fantasy and tracking this kind of stuff. Um, that would be my anticipation of how this might play out. We'll see if it does, but that would be my guess. And so I will watch Grubauer in the spot where I have him tonight. I'll watch how this game goes. If it goes well from here on out, then I might consider hanging on to him if I've got other players that I can drop and make moves with. You know, I've already made a couple of moves in that league where I have him uh, for the start of the week here because I had to get some streamers. It's a highly competitive league. So I thought that I needed to 
yeah, prioritize that. But I still wanted to get the start out of Grubauer. It is a points league, so I will get some points um, as long as he doesn't completely stink it up tonight. So that was how I decided to play that, and I'm still deciding on whether I will continue to hold him kind of just based on his performance in this game here tonight. And the same kind of goes for Decord. I'll wait to get confirmation that he's going to start on Thursday. You know, if Grubauer got absolutely destroyed in this game um, from here on out and allowed like seven goals in the end, then, you know, I might rush out and grab Decord because it's going to take a little bit more trust for Grubauer to get back from that. And at that point, I might anticipate that there's a pretty strong chance that Decord is going to get both the Thursday and Saturday games this week. And like I said, I do think it's a situation where the goaltender is a valuable piece to have so that's a long-winded way of saying I'm just monitoring the situation very closely and there's a lot of contingencies and things I might do uh, differently depending on the result of both this game and the potential starter for the Thursday game Williams in the chat hey William is it time to drop Tyler Bertuzzi um on one hand, yes, <laughs> because it's not a terrific uh, spot that he's in overall. You know, in the last five games here, you can see just over 16 minutes, just a couple of points. Underlying metrics are okay, but definitely not inspiring for fantasy purposes. He's only got three points in eight games on the season. The one thing that is giving me pause is that the Leafs have a terrific schedule for next week. And so... That's the part that's really got me uh, kind of wondering whether I should be hanging on to that um, and how much stock I should be putting into that next week's schedule. For this week, the Leafs play uh, tomorrow night, Tuesday night uh, against the LA Kings. That's an off night, so that's one that you're definitely going to fit in. But then they play Thursday and Saturday, which are both pretty heavy nights. You're actually kind of unlikely that uh, Bertuzzi is going to get in your lineup for those two games. So then you're sitting him for quite a long time before you get him back in for next week. So I might be a situation in which I hang on to him for the Tuesday game tomorrow and then uh, kind of see how that goes. If he, you know, if it's a nothing game, once again, I might drop him at that point and then reevaluate if he's a player that I want to re-add for, you know, Monday next week when the Leafs do have a Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule to start the week, all off nights, three straight off nights to start the week. That's definitely something that you're going to be interested in. So, uh, you know, it obviously depends on who else you have, who else you can drop. Um, if there is somebody else that's uh, similar to Tyler Bertuzzi, then maybe this schedule for next week is a little bit of a tiebreaker for you. You can use it that way. But overall, if you're looking for permission to drop Tyler Bertuzzi, you absolutely have permission. He is not playing particularly well. And it's honestly not a player that I had a huge projection on because I think the Leafs really do have a defined role for this player. Um, similar to bunting, you know, right now, Kelly Yarncroak's on the top line with Matthews and Marner, and it's Bertuzzi on the second line with um, um, Nylander and Tavares. And honestly, that's almost been a better spot to be at even strikes uh, through the early going here with how hot Nylander and Tavares have been. But overall, I just don't think that you're ever going to see much more than the 16 minutes a night from Tyler Bertuzzi. And is that enough to sustain you in weeks where the schedule isn't all that great? I don't know. So that's where I'm at with Tyler Bertuzzi. I think that, uh, I think that it is definitely a player that you have permission to drop for this week if you need the spot. All right, let's keep talking here about Chris Letang. Letang is a player that I was very high on uh, relative to a lot of people coming into the season. I thought that there was a really strong chance that he was going to stick on the top power play. That's not been the case through the early part of the season. He still does have five assists and five total points in eight games on the season, but just two in his last five. Still skating about 24 minutes and 45 seconds a night through this last stretch of five games. The underlying stats are not terrific, but still pretty good. 50th in shots per 60 amongst all defensemen, 35th in Corsi 4 per 60, 64th in scoring chances 4 per 60. So, Still pretty useful player overall, and definitely Chris Letang is one of those guys who gives you those banger stats, and that's what you really like about what he brings to the table along with that offensive upside. So overall, um, 
I don't think you're dropping Chris Letang unless you're just absolutely stacked on D and it's like a 10 team league or something like that. I don't think you're dropping Chris Letang, but I am adjusting expectations, obviously, um, because it does seem like the Penguins are not going to use him on the top power play unit unless something has changed in this game here tonight uh, that's ongoing and they've gone back to that. Um, now it looks like they've had uh, power play already and it's been the same old story uh, with Carlson as the lone defenseman there. So um, I do think that Latang still has the upside to get back there and I still think that he's a very usable fantasy piece especially in something like a Bangers Cats League. Um, I overall just think that you know I thought he had 60 plus point upside if you would get power play one without that you're probably looking at a 45 50 point uh, defenseman at the end of the year and you can kind of track for yourself how you think that uh, how much that's worth I guess in the end right now with the five points in eight games he's tracking for 51 points if you prorate that over an 82 game schedule that sounds about right to me uh, on the season for Chris Letang uh, given what we know so far. Next one up, Jordan Cairo, just two assists for him as well in his last five games, is getting about 18 and a half minutes uh, average time on ice through this stretch. 80th in shots for 60, 81st in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60. Team con context here, not great. 156 in Corsi, 4 per 60, and 110th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. The Blues are truly terrible uh, on the season so far, like giving the San Jose Sharks a run for their money. Uh, kind of terrible. And Kairou just has three points total in seven games. I do think this is a little bit of a buy low here because I do think that Kairou is the kind of player who can can, um, yeah, legitimately elevate above his surroundings. And I think that the surroundings are probably good enough to not drag him down too much. Um, I think that he'll, in most cases, you know, still be attached to Robert Thomas and a lot of, for a lot of the season or Pavel Buchnevich or both, uh, definitely on the power play. And one thing that the Blues have done a little bit more of this year is to load up on the top power play with Kairou, with Buchnevich, with Thomas, and run that unit a little bit more as a true top unit um, than they have in years past. And so that's a general plus for Kairou. I do think that, you know, with the way things are going, it's uh, one of these situations that you got to think that there could be a coaching change in the offing. I actually talked about this last year that they probably should have fired Craig Berube last year because they did not look good under the hood and they kept kind of lucking into winning games. If you go, you know, mathematically lucking into winning games, if not uh, actually lucking into it, but um I think that there's every chance that brube has gone at some point, if not sooner than later, uh, for this team. And then who knows at that point, right? Maybe the new coach loves Kairou, plays him 21 minutes a night, and he's a star. Maybe the new coach hates Kairou and he plays him 14 minutes a night, and you're just uh, totally lost as to where all your fantasy production went to. Overall, I think Kairou is in a spot now where people are realizing that the Blues are bad. They're probably assigning that value to Kairou, and I think he's better than that. I don't know if he'll hit the uh, kind of more lofty projection 70 plus points that I put on him for this season. I don't know if that's in the cards because the Blues are just that bad. And, um, you know, a, another injury to a guy like Buchnevich or something like that can really negatively impact Kairou because they have nothing behind a guy like Buchnevich for him to play with. So there are some mitigating factors that have me... Uh, a little bit off of where I would have had Kairou at the start of the season. But overall, uh, I'm going to bet on the talent, bet on the player here. And I think that Kairou is all that uh, in terms of the talent. So still think this is a really talented player worth rostering, worth kicking tires on, um, especially in weeks where the Blues have a good schedule like this week. So I'm interested in Kairou for sure. But uh, overall... Uh, you do have to build in just a little bit that the Blues are so bad that it might be a problem for his uh, total ceiling as a player. Chris in the chat. Hey, Nate, this is a question for Deeper League. What do you make of Evangelista? Luke Evangelista over in Nashville has been getting some run on the top unit over there, the top power play unit. That's a good spot to be. No two ways about that. Um, 
getting that over Tommy Novak is a little bit of a surprise, but definitely a good surprise for Evangelista. It's a good spot to be. Roman Yossi, Philip Forsberg, Ryan O'Reilly, Tyson Berry, those are all legitimate players on a top power play unit. And Luke Evangelista just kind of uh, being there, even if he's only there along for the ride, is not a bad place to be whatsoever. Uh, so you like the deployment for sure. Is he going to get enough minutes in the last five games? He definitely has been nearly 17 minutes a game over the last five, and he's got five points in his last five games, so he's definitely feeling it a little bit there. Uh, the underlying metrics are not terrific, as you'd probably expect. 128th in shots per 60, 105th in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60, about the same range for the on-ice stats as well, despite the power play deployment. Um Overall, I wouldn't say that I'm excited about Luke Evangelisa, but in a deeper league, you can definitely do worse um, for sure. The uh, Predators this week do play tomorrow, Tuesday on the off night, but then Thursday, Saturday on heavy nights. So that's going to be tough to get into your lineup. I'm not sure if I'm running out to add Luke Evangelista to then sit him for Thursday, Saturday. So that part is the part that's the trickiest for me. Um, but the player just on the player evaluation alone, I do think that this is a player with some upside. Um, and you have to love the deployment. So if you're in a deeper league, if you're in a spot where you really do need someone to just fill out your roster, then definitely Luke Evangelista is someone that I have some optimism for given his current deployment. Ricky Garcia asks, are you optimistic about Hronik? His situation feels similar to Taves McCarr and so far is putting up decent numbers. I actually do really like Philip Hronik. He was a guy that, you know, I've been actually talking about in the in the uh, waiver wire show sometimes just as a long-term hold. If you need a fourth defenseman or a fifth defenseman, um, he's definitely someone who can fill that for you. He's got seven assists in eight games on the season, no goals yet. Five assists in five games, his last five games here, and averaging over 24 and a half minutes per night. 39th amongst all defensemen, shots per 60 in this last stretch of five games. 24th in Corsi, 4 per 60. 29th in scoring chances, 4 per 60. It's a good spot. He's playing a ton of minutes uh, for a team that we know can score goals in the Vancouver Canucks. Playing there alongside Quinn Hughes. I am pretty bullish, honestly, on Hronik as just a guy... Yeah, very similar to Taves. Uh, I think it's a really apt comparison to make uh, Taves and Makar, Quinn Hughes, and Philip Ronick here. I don't know that he's got that terrific ceiling unless there was to be some sort of injury to Quinn Hughes. But, you know, if you get a guy who you can plug in and he's just that back end of your roster defenseman that you just leave in week after week after week, you don't worry about it. He provides peripherals as well. Like it's not like he's hanging you out to dry if you're in a banger's cats either. So he's doing all of that. And if Hughes ever were to go down to injury, then you have this contingent upside where Hronik could actually turn into, you know, a really nice player. Uh, if he got all that power play one usage over there in Vancouver. So I'm actually a pretty big fan of Philip Hronik myself. All right, we got to keep rolling here. I got to be out of here in about 15 minutes. So let's get through this. Let's talk about Owen Tippett a little bit. We did touch on Owen Tippett. Uh, you can go back and watch the waiver wire episode that we released. Tippett continues to play on the top line, averaging just over 15 and a half minutes time on ice through his last five games. Has five points, one goal in his last five games. Second in the league in shots per 60 through this stretch. 33rd in individual scoring chances, four per 60. Those are numbers we like to see. Owen Tippett had a rough start, but has really bounced back in a big way the last five games, getting that top line deployment over there in Philadelphia. Obviously, Philadelphia has a terrific schedule for this week. Hopefully, you got Tippett in your leagues for this week uh, at the very least, and then we'll kind of reevaluate from there. If you want uh, more of a take, you can definitely go back to the waiver wire episode uh, from Saturday and check that one out uh, for more of Blake and I's thoughts on Tippett. The same will go for a couple other guys who were pretty highly requested in the Discord server, Barrett Hayton and Jonathan Huberto. Both of these players, Blake and I talked about at length in the episode that came out today uh, on the YouTube channel and on the podcast. So you can go check out that, the flagship weekly show. We talked about both Barrett Hayton and Jonathan Huberto uh, in pretty great detail. Uh, so you can go check that out if you want those takes there. Brock Nelson came up on this list too. Has two goals in his last five games. I think people are getting a little bit worried, though. Just four points total in seven games. That's a 47-point pace. That's not great overall, but averaging just under 18 minutes average time on ice. 
I actually am still quite bullish on Nelson. If there is a buy low opportunity here, I am definitely in on it. You can see here, Brock Nelson over this last uh, stretch here, 10th in the league in shots per 60. First in individual scoring chances, 4 per 60 is Brock Nelson. Uh, so those are the kind of numbers that, uh, that get my attention for sure. That'll move the needle for me, uh, definitely. So Brock Nelson, a guy that I'm actually quite bullish on. Yeah, the shots for 60 on the season, even way, way above what he's been able to do in the past. And, you know, maybe you don't expect that to continue, but Honestly, this is the best Brock Nelson has ever played from an offensive standpoint, and he's just not getting rewarded for it right now. So I do think that there are much better days ahead for Brock Nelson, and if you can buy low on Brock Nelson right now, I would absolutely advocate that you go do that immediately. Kirill Kaprizov made the list here, just three assists in his last five games, but averaging over 23 minutes time on ice, still pretty respectable numbers under the hood despite that insane deployment 41st in shots for 60 54th in individual scoring chances four per 60 on ice numbers even better 21st in Corsi four per 60 22nd in scoring chances four per 60 and I mean the guy's got nine points in nine games to start the season so it's not like he's uh, exactly fallen off the face of the earth here but if there is you know that right reactionary manager in your league uh, where they're looking at these splits and they're seeing ah oh, man this guy hasn't scored in five games uh, gotta get him off my roster if you can package up from somebody who's a little bit hotter um you know we've talked we actually talked about some of those in the show that blake and i did that came out uh today monday the flagship weekly show so if you want to check out uh some of the players that we were talking about if you can package up to go get a kirill kaprizov just from somebody who's maybe overreacting in the early season here sees that he has zero goals in his last five games and it's like ah this is not the guy that i paid a first round pick for in my league I would absolutely be smashing that button trying to get Kaprizov. I absolutely think that the sky's the limit for Kaprizov this year. I think I had a 107-point projection on him for the season and 50 goals. Like, I think the world of Kaprizov, you got Ryan Hartman popping off, and somehow Kaprizov is just not getting in on that. You see the 38% IPP over the last five games. That's not going to continue. Kaprizov is way too big a factor and way too good for that to continue much longer. So... If there is an opportunity to buy low on Kaprizov, this is it. You should definitely go knock and at least inquire about Kirill Kaprizov in your leagues. Talk about a few more goalies here. Uh, we've got Stuart Skinner and uh, Jack Campbell, the Edmonton situation. Similar to Seattle, I do think that this is a situation that you want to get in on. I think that the Oilers have had a pretty bad stretch of luck, all things considered. I don't think the sky is falling the way that the media over there is uh, making it seem. They are fourth in the league at even strength, scoring chances for percentage and fourth in Corsi for percentage. They're they're fine, folks. There's nothing to see here. Everybody go home, put your pitchforks away. The Edmonton Oilers will be fine. And when they are getting back to being fine and being one of the better teams in the entire league, that's going to drag on whoever can, you know, just not suck terribly <laughs> from their goaltenders. And, you know, right now, I guess that's Stuart Skinner. Skinner, uh, you know, it's not exactly a massive accomplishment to, uh, you know, make 24 saves and allow a couple goals against Calgary these days. Uh, Calgary has not been great, but, you know, he got the W there. He had a decent game the game before that against the Rangers, allowing three goals and 32 shots in that one. So they've gone back to him for back-to-back -back games here. He's performed decently well. I, If I'm picking between the two, it's definitely Skinner at this point. And I did go out and uh, grab Skinner in a league where he was dropped. So I definitely think that if he is out there, if somebody's um, kind of reactionarily dropped Skinner, then he is kind of a priority ad because this is a goaltender on a good team. And that's really my, my biggest criteria for picking up goaltenders is, is the team doing something that I can get behind? Is this guy potentially going to get volume there? If both of those boxes are checked, then that's definitely a player that I want to have and I want to hang on to for as long as it works. And then, you know, if it doesn't work out, I'd picked up Stuart Skinner off waivers. If it doesn't work out, I will drop him back to waivers and I'm not going to think twice about it. So that's the beauty of Zero G at work. And we'll hopefully see Stuart Skinner go on a big run here and make this waiver pickup by myself look truly incredible. Hopefully that's what happens. I don't know. We'll see. I don't have 
you know, really any confidence in either Skinner or Campbell, but right now it's Skinner for me and uh, we'll see where it goes from there. Jacob Markstrom, the other one that was mentioned here to talk about, it's not been a great situation, uh, obviously. Once again, uh, Blake and I did talk about the Calgary team situation as a whole, uh, again, at kind of at length in the episode, uh, the flagship episode that came out today, Monday. So well, I won't rehash all of that, but basically I do think that there should be, by the math, better days ahead for Calgary as a team. There does seem to be some bad vibes around it, but I do think that in general we're kind of double counting just because of what last season was, and it seems like it's the same old story this season. Obviously there's a new coach in town, things are different, but the results are the same, and that can be frustrating, but I do think that you know they'll get things untracked um, to some extent. I don't think this is a upper echelon team in the league by any stretch, but I do think that this is should be like a bubble playoff team and that a goaltender there should provide some value. I don't think Markstrom has honestly been that bad bad overall he's got a 901 save percentage um, earlier in the season he was doing a little bit better he's trended down slightly over the last little bit uh, but the team has also trended down in that time so I think he is just kind of dependent on the team I think he's just probably not a netminder that's going to vastly out uh, exceed his team's performance at this stage so that's the kind of problem if there is one with Markstrom is you're a little bit dependent on how the team's doing the team's cold right now so Markstrom is going to be cold um, you know I don't actually personally have Markstrom anywhere he always seemed to go a little bit ahead of where I was considering uh, making a draft pick on him that being said um, if I had him I think I would still continue to hang on unless there was like a priority ad like if uh, Grubauer really uh, yeah, if he self-destructs in this game against Tampa Bay here and Decord starts to be like, okay, this guy's definitely going to get some run here, then maybe I would consider that because that would become kind of a priority add as a goaltender. So that's kind of the only situation is if there's somebody else out there who like is a, a clear rising player uh, getting a ton of deployment and on a better situation. That's the only situation which I'm probably thinking about dropping uh, Jacob Markstrom. So let's keep rolling and talk about Evander Kane. Uh, Kane, one of these players who seem to kind of oddly uh, benefit from the Connor McDavid injury. He went on a little bit of a heater here, five points in his last five games. Nice little stretch, including a pretty big game uh, yesterday in the uh, out outdoor game that they played there averaging over 18 minutes per game still doing what he normally does 32nd in shots per 60 52nd in individual scoring chances four per 60 the interesting thing will continue to be where he lines up at even strength in this last game uh, on the left wing with Ryan Nugent Hopkins and Zach Hyman that's a good spot not going to be mad about that if that's where he sticks but he's never going to be a top power play player in my mind unless you know there is an injury to Zach Hyman or Ryan Nugent Hopkins or somebody else and he gets back up there that way otherwise I think it is probably a situation where Hyman will continue to see all of the power play one work uh, for the rest of the season so take that into account that's what I took into account when I was building my projection on Evander Kane I think he's had a nice little stretch here in you know in bangers cats he's gonna do that for you he's gonna hit a ton he's gonna shoot a ton provide all those categories for you but you can't expect big big numbers from Evander Kane he's never really been that guy um, he's never really been that 70 plus point guy so I don't expect him to be that here unless he were to get on the top power play for an extended stretch due to injury or some other reason but you do still have that contingent upside with Kane so overall I think the player is what he is he's probably exactly who you thought he was when you drafted him at the start of the season um, and I don't see any reason to really deviate from that moving forward. Elias Lindholm was another player brought up in a lot of spots. Obviously, going back to the Calgary situation, don't need to rehash all of that, but Lindholm, just one goal in his last five games, no assists, skating just under 21 minutes a night, so he's getting tons of deployment. Under the hood, the numbers are not great. 148th in shots for 60, 161st in individual scoring chances for per 60. On-ice numbers, not much better. 126th in Corsi for per 60 and 159th in scoring chances for per 60. On the season, he's got six points in nine games. That's a 55-point pace. I think that, you know, he'll probably do a little better than that, but 
I don't know that we're talking about the Elias Lindholm of old who is pushing a point per game and doing all of that. I think we might be looking at uh, an Elias Lindholm is in the 65 to 70 point range at the best of times. Um, the deployment is great, um, I will say, and I do think that Calgary will have a little bit of a rebound from their current status. So I do think that he's going to come up from the current 55 point pace on the season, but Will he come up uh, really beyond the point where he's like super, super fantasy relevant? I'm not super convinced. So Elias Lindholm is someone who's definitely decreased a little bit in my eyes, just given the struggles going on there in Calgary so far. Nico Heischer is an interesting one. Obviously, the Devils have kind of moved around some things. Nico Heischer, at least outside of injury, has continued to... Uh, kind of cement a spot on the top uh, power play there and it does seem like he'll be back in so you don't really feel too worried about Nico Heischer being out long term with his current injury uh, all that said you know there is always that nagging wonder in your mind this last game they went with the Toffoli Meyer Brat Hughes Hughes top power play and they netted two goals so what if they just decide hey that actually really worked we don't need Nico Heischer to play all these uh, power play minutes and we can still get terrific production from this top power play what if they decide that Nico Heischer can just uh, sit there on the second power play unit that would obviously be a huge hit to his production and Nico Heischer is not a guy who has terrific underlying stats ever. Uh, he has good enough stats and pretty great deployment on a good team, good offensive situation, and that's kind of how he comes to his fantasy relevance. So overall, Nico Heischer is not someone I'm just ever going to be super excited about. And um, yeah, maybe maybe there is like a little sell window if he comes back and has a good game when he does come back. Then there is a little bit of a sell window where you can move off him, but you know, the early returns have not been great. He's only got two goals, no assists in his first seven games. Um, I'm not worried about him, you know, just being completely terrible for the rest of the season, but I have some some qualms just given how the season has, go, has gone. Like, I said it openly at the beginning of the season. I thought there was no chance that Dougie Hamilton got moved off the top power play unit for Luke Hughes. That's happened very early in the season here. So who's to say that it couldn't be Nico Heischer next? Um, definitely not me. I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't dream of, of saying that given what's gone on in New Jersey so far this season. So there is that little bit of a worry. I don't know how big of a worry that is for me personally. But, you know, in the end... You have to you have to come to some sort of decision on the player, and maybe the ceiling here is is not quite what you had hoped for. You got to think that though, um, just given the offensive acumen around him, that he's going to be fine. Uh, I don't think you need to sell low if that's what the case is. If someone's just looking at the the points they scored so far, you don't need to do that. If you do want to sell, then I would wait until he inevitably has a stretch of good games once again, and then I would move off of him at that point. But I don't think you need to rush out and get rid of Nico Heischer. If you can sell him just based on name value and the fact that, you know, oh yeah, he's going to go straight back to power play one and the Devils are crushing as a team. If you can sell him based on that and you feel like you just don't want to be a part of that situation then I won't blame you um, but that's where I'm at on Nico Heischer just not a super exciting player for me by any stretch I want to get through the last two players here real quick and then I gotta go but Eric Carlson three points in his last five games just under 25 minutes a night I'm not concerned about Eric Carlson he's second amongst all defensemen in individual scoring chances four per 60 ninth in Corsi four per 60 fourth in scoring chances four per 60 while skating that kind of insane amount of ice time I just have no concerns uh, about Eric Carlson to be honest with you I really don't think that we need to he's got a goal and an assist in the game here today so far so there you go no worries about Eric Carlson and he should get back to doing what he does and that's scoring a boatload of points Rupe Hints is another player that has come up four points in five games so far has battled some injuries 16 and a half minutes average time on ice is the real concern because under the hood he looks really good 14th in shots for 60 16th in individual scoring chances four per 60 on ice numbers not quite as good 59th in Corsi four per 60 42nd in scoring chances four per 60 
Uh, overall, I'm not too concerned about hints the player. The deployment is a little bit concerning. It seems like Dallas is doing this a little bit, making a little bit more of a concerted effort to not overwork the top players, which is a little bit baffling to me, to be quite honest. But um, that's something worth monitoring. But I'm not worried about Rupe hints and, uh, you know, Baby Dry is a guy that I'm always going to stand behind. So overall, I'm not worried about Hints. I do think he's going to be a point-per-game player when all settles at the end of the season. All right, we got through it all. So that's going to be all that we've got for this episode. Hopefully, it brought you some value, helped you get a little bit better at fantasy hockey today. If you like the advanced stats and that focus that you saw here today, then all those stats came from Natural Stat Trick. You can go check that out. It's a terrific free resource. Many thanks to the band there there for supplying the music for this podcast. Be sure to check out their Spotify as well. That's it, folks. Much love. Mm-hmm.